Love is the most formidable force in the universe and it would cause a man to do the unthinkable. And we would see that love stories are actually, they're adventurous, they're action packed, they're beautiful. And so I share this with him and he looks at me and he says, you would love the Bible. I was like, what? Hey gang, welcome back to Directed Life, the official show for kingdom content creators, entrepreneurs, and influencers to help them be directed by the Holy Spirit in their craft, career, and calling to flip culture right side up. I'm your host, Cap Chatfield, and today I'm going to be sharing a long overdue video. I have a handful of people who have been following me for a while, I've been seeing some of the content I've been putting out, but very few people know my salvation story where everything Change where I went from being a narcissist, alcoholic, drug addict. It's crazy that I'm even thinking about this and all the things that I used to do, womanizer, everything in between. And I had an encounter with God that changed everything, changed everything. I'm going to share this whole story with you. But before I do, let me tell you this if you've been enjoying this content, if you're following me on Instagram, social media, on YouTube, there's one thing that you're possibly missing. You're missing the email list. The email list is the most important thing for you to be subscribed to because in a world where we don't know how algorithms change and whether or not I'm going to have access to you in the future with my content or all the content's going to get to you, the best thing you can do is to get on the email list. It'll ensure that you are always encouraged, always equipped. And I get a lot of emails in my inbox and emails can be annoying, but I promise you that these emails will be encouraging. They'll help you develop the mindset that you need to fulfill your calling in Jesus, especially as a content creator. It'll be practical as well if you're trying to grow as a content creator for the kingdom of God. Cannot encourage you enough. Go to capchatfield.com, K-A-P-C-H-A-T-F-I-E-L-D.com. You'll see the link in the description of this episode of this video as well. Go there. Submit your email, get on the email list. You will not want to miss it and you will not regret it. So check that out now into the content. So I have an interesting story and it's really the foundation of everything that I'm about as a, as a creator, as a content creator. You might know my tagline, uh, I exist to reveal the glory of God on every glowing screen. And uh, the reason why is because I don't want to just mass get a ton of followers for the sake of followers or a ton of reach and influence but because behind every screen is a soul. And I believe that we are in an amazing era where we have the ability to reach people all over the world by creating content led by the Holy Spirit. And so that's my desire. That's the point of this YouTube channel. That's the point of this podcast. But it began with a very pivotal moment in my life, the day that I had an encounter with Jesus in my car on the way to the gym during in college. And uh, I was never the same after that. So let me take it, take it from the beginning. The story begins with me growing up in Maryland in the DC metropolitan area. I grew up in a great home. My parents are amazing people. It's a home of encouragement, a home of love. I have a great relationship with my parents to this day. My family was a church going family. We went to an Episcopal church growing up and then later went to a Methodist church. Uh, if you're not familiar with those denominations, very traditional church setting. So uh, wooden pews, people are wearing nice clothes. Uh, it's, they give you a bulletin on your way in, tons of old people, if I might say. And you're sitting in the pew that you stand up, you sit down, you stand up, you sit down, and you open up the hymnal, you close the hymnal, and you wrap up the whole thing in about an hour. And so it smelled like an old church, like it's got that old church smell. I'll tell you this, like church just really, I was hungry for God, I guess as a little kid, but over time, especially in middle school, when I started hanging out with some of the wrong people, I started to really question my faith. And I'll be honest too, I, I didn't really understand why we did what we did. I didn't understand the foundation of what it meant to have a relationship with God. It, it seemed more about like, being a good person and living a moral life. That was kind of like what it sounded like church was about. So I didn't really get what the point of it was. You know, I, I we'd go to church every Sunday and then I knew a lot of the people outside of church. And I was like, you guys aren't really living this thing that you're committing your Sundays to. Like, if we don't really believe in what we're doing here, why don't we just sleep in? I would have much rather slept in, especially in my teen years. My parents had me go through this thing called confirmation. Confirmation, if you're familiar with it, it's basically at 13 years old, 
you go through these classes and you make your faith your own essentially. And I'll be honest, at this point, I was actually decently interested in the things of God to the degree where I actually had a conversation with my reverend. And um, we were, we're at this confirmation retreat towards the end of this confirmation class. And I told my reverend, I said, I'm interested in knowing who God is. In fact, what I'd like to do is I want to read the whole Bible from, uh, from beginning to end. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a 13 year old kid kind of looking for some encouragement. And as a, I would imagine as a reverend hearing a 13 year old say that is like probably one of the best things you could hear as a reverend. And his response really landed on the ground with a thud. Honestly, it really took me by surprise because he didn't encourage me and he wasn't really excited for my interest. He said, I don't know if I would do that if I were you. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty long and it's confusing and some parts kind of get repetitive. And uh, he is probably trying to dis, you know, keep me from being discouraged by trying to read it by myself. And uh, it did the exact opposite. So spoiler alert, if you're in that place right now and you feel like, man, I don't know if I want to encourage them to read the Bible because they might not get it. And you got to encourage them to read the Bible, to open it. And the Holy Spirit, it says in first John, will lead them into all truth. God wants us to understand who he is more than we want to understand who he is. And so if we just get in the Bible, God can do something miraculous, but then also come alongside that person and help them understand the Bible as they're reading it. So I digress, but maybe someone needs to hear that. If you're in that place, do not do what this man did to me because I went in the complete opposite direction, imaginably so, he basically told me this thing was completely irrelevant. So I said, if this guy, my reverend, doesn't even think that this book is worth reading, I'm certainly not going to read this thing. And so that began this journey of me going down this crazy path, really leading into debauchery and abandoning the faith completely in, in high school. I was an atheist. I thought Christians were stupid. I had a great time demeaning and criticizing and quote unquote persecuting Christians. I was ruthless. Anytime I met a Christian, I let them have it. Just showed them how dumb I thought they were. And I'm not proud of it, but it was like, I was like Saul in the Bible, minus actually killing people. I didn't kill anyone, but I killed them in my heart and in the spirit for sure. And that was who I was. I was into partying. I was into drinking. I was, I was into smoking. I was into girls. I was a skateboarder. We'd go downtown and we'd skate all the time and party. It was just a really crazy lifestyle, but I still did pretty well in school. And so I came to the place where I was like thinking about what to do for college. I didn't want to go down like any traditional route. I was really interested in filmmaking. That's kind of what I discovered about myself because I was a skateboarder. We would go and skate and film each other's tricks. And then I'd go home and I would edit these clips all by myself for hours. And I loved, I really fell in love with the video editing process. I decided to go to the university of Miami in Florida, not the Miami and Omaha, uh, in Ohio, the real Miami in Florida. I went to the University of Miami to study film, but you better believe I also went there with some other motives. I wanted to go party on South Beach. I wanted to be in a fraternity. I wanted to just live that fast lifestyle. And I did. And it was crazy. I did all of that, joined a fraternity, was partying every weekend, smoking weed three to five times a day, waking up next to ladies that I didn't even remember their name the next day. As gross as that is, it was my past. That was, that's how lost I was. I was just going down that path, thinking it was fulfilling, thinking that it was cool. And over time, it really just started to eat at my soul. And I tried to just suppress it, suppress that feeling by just going into it more and more and more. But I wasn't like a total burnout. Like I said, I had pretty good grades. And I actually, I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit. It's part of how God made me. And me and my, my roommates who were all you know, kind of one of them was a little bit less like this, but we were kind of potheads and surfers and we, uh, we were all into the good vibes and stuff like that. And, and this is also kind of when my atheism began to turn into, you know, agnosticism and believing that there had to have been some greater power out there because atheism, like if you're an atheist, here's the facts. If you're an atheist, you don't believe that there's any God. You don't believe that there's any purpose. And because of that, your life has no meaning. There's nothing that happens after you die. There's no objective truth. Your truth is your truth. So it's all moral relativism and it's completely meaningless. It's a meaningless, hopeless, joyless experience because there's no system. There's no grid. There's no truth. I guess I was kind of fed up with that. And I started to believe that there had to have been something more. I was being led, uh, really, I think by the Holy Spirit to be curious about eternity. 
and things beyond what I could see in uh, the natural realm. So I started to get really into new ageism. I was like, you know, a good vibes guy, manifest your destiny, visualize it, speak it into the universe, all those sorts of things. I, I was going to go down that path to a pretty high degree, but thankfully the Lord rescued me because it got, it's get, it gets pretty demonic once you go down that route too much. And I experienced a lot of that as well. But in that season of like the good vibes feel, my buddy and I started this tank top company. It's full circle. I'm a mosaic communicator. So uh, hold on with me. It all makes sense. So we started this business, me and my roommates called Gift Tanks. It's Miami. Everyone's walking around sleeveless. Everybody loves tank tops. And these tank tops had images of things that we were thankful for, grateful for, like strawberries and waves and sailboats and pineapples and suns and all that, like, like the sun in the sky. And they all had these little smiley faces on them and they said, give tanks underneath them. And our desire was to inspire gratitude, inspire thankfulness in people around us. And the tank tops took off. People really loved them. People loved them all on campus. Other campuses really liked them. Other schools, we started selling them all over the world, but I smoked way too much weed to know how to do math. So the business completely flopped from that standpoint, but it was a cool experience. And we also were giving a portion of the proceeds to at-risk kids in Nicaragua. So think about all of this. Like, Not only am I partying like crazy. I'm also running a business and I'm also have pretty good grades and we're giving money away to kids in Nicaragua. So not only was I broken inside, but I had the self-righteousness on the outside that kept me from really thinking anything was actually wrong. And this is all while like I'm pursuing a filmmaking degree and trying to visualize my future because I was the director of my life. I was the God of my own life. Really, that's what the new age belief system really is, is like, you're God, you're in control, you call the shots, you visualize your future, you make it happen. The universe will bend its knee to your will. That's basically what people are interested in because we all want to be our own gods to a certain degree. I was the director of my life and I wanted to be the greatest filmmaker that ever walked the face of the earth. So I'm building this business though. My buddy and I end up going to Mardi Gras in New Orleans, which was yeah, that was a trip. We went to Mardi Gras to go slang tank tops that we're walking down Bourbon Street. We're already been partying a little bit. I'll tell you this. Bourbon Street was like an avalanche of debauchery. Just drunk people, people doing drugs, people throwing up on the side, people with their ladies with their tops off. Even as a heathen, it was nuts. There's all this stuff going on. It was crazy. And then in the middle of the road, I see this giant wooden cross. And I'm like, what the Smurf is that? Obviously, it's like a glaring juxtaposition to everything else that's happening around us. And I walk up and there's all of these fire breathing Baptists with these signs that said like, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, you know, be forgiven of your sins, like hell is real, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, this is the biggest buzzkill ever. So I walk up to one of these ladies and I'm a good vibes guy, like nothing gets me down, nothing makes me upset. It, this was unshakable. And so I went up to this one lady, a woman. I didn't even go up to a man. I went up to a woman with one of these signs. And I was like, who do you think you are? Like, who are you to say I'm not a good person? And then I started telling her like, look at me. Like I, I'm a college student. I'm running this company. And we're giving money to kids in Nicaragua. Like I'm a good person. And she said to me, like in the most patient and gentle way, she said, you're not doing that for God's glory though. You're doing it for your own glory. And I was like, what the heck does that even mean? I was like super puzzled, but she planted a seed that I didn't really, I didn't have words for, but it was, it definitely caught my attention because I was just like, whatever lady, take my business card, check out our website, see what we're about. And you'll see that I am a good person and you'll regret everything that you just said to me. So I go off, we continue partying and I could not get this lady out of my mind. I was so upset by what she had said to me. And so it was like, it, it was that even that part even kind of, I was wrestling with, I was like, I'm supposed to be the good vibes to give tanks guy. And I can't get this lady out of my mind. And, and she's really upset me. So I go back to school. We drive back home to, uh, to Miami, which is like 13 hour drive. And then I sat down to, to hang out with the one Christian friend that I had. And the reason why he was the one Christian friend that I had is because he didn't judge me. He loved me right where I was at. And he was relatable, super relatable guy pursuing business. And so we're, we're hanging out, we're chatting and I'm sharing with him my experience. And I was like, bro, 
Like y'all, you Christians are whack, dude. We had this really wild experience. We were chatting with this one lady. She was judging me and all this sort of stuff. And kind of just sat there and nodded. And he even was like, man, I, I think her approach was pretty out there. So, you know, I'm sorry that that was your experience, but I don't think she was totally wrong with what she said. And I was kind of a little puzzled. I was like, what do you mean? And this is when the conversation got really heavy because he said, Cap, do you believe everybody's going to go to heaven when they die? And I was like, uh, I think so. I mean, we're all trying our best. Everyone's trying to be a good person. Like, yeah, I think everyone should go to heaven. And I would believe that they do go to heaven when they die. Then he took a breath and he said, with more conviction than I've ever seen anybody talk about eternity in my life, he said, Cap, not everybody's going to heaven. In fact, most people won't. And I remember when he said that, I was like, I was really moved. Not because I necessarily believed what he said, but my whole life I'd gone to church and had seen people come to church, but leave and not really live like they believed the stuff that was in that book. We never even opened the book. And I was like, dude, this guy really believes that this is real. And I can tell that he's really concerned about me. And now I'm quite honest, I'm a little concerned too, because I don't really know why I believe what I believe, but he knows why he believes what he believes. And then he kind of like, he brought the plane down, like the intensity kind of de decreased. And he said, what type of movies did you say you wanted to make again? I, like, I want to be a filmmaker. And I said, man, just to kind of rewind, what the answer that I responded to him with was based off of this background for me. At this point in my life, my parents' marriage was like kind of a spiraling out of control. It looked like they were about to call it quits on their marriage. I obviously, that's super devastating for anybody to see um, their parents go through. And then I also uh, was in a relationship with a girl in college that fell apart. I think I, I was more into her than she was into me. I wore my heart on my sleeve and I think it freaked her out. And so I had this vision that if people could, if there was a redemption of the idea of romance, I just thought everything would change. This is what my answer was to him. I said, I want to make the baddest romance movies ever. And I explained to him that if, you know, we could get away from this mindset that romance is chick flicky and it's just for girls, but recognize that love is the most formidable force in the universe and it would cause a man to do the unthinkable then we would see that love stories are actually they're adventurous they're action-packed they're beautiful and and what would happen is if men and women could understand what true romance actually was men would know how to love women properly women would know how to receive love properly family units would stay together there'd be respect there'd be honor kids would grow up not in broken homes and you're changing generations because of the ability to just redeem what true romance was. And so I share this with him and he looks at me and he says, you would love the Bible. I was like, what? My whole life, I thought it was this irrelevant rule book. I had a reverend who told me not to even read it. And so I was like, what do you mean I would love the Bible? And he says, well, think about the fairy tale structure, right? A knight in shining armor lays down his life for a princess who's held captive under a curse in a high tower, being protected and guarded by a, a dragon. And the knight in shining armor slays the dragon to rescue the princess and so they could live happily ever after, right? Like that's the idea of really dope or, or bad love, right? These, the, the baddest romance movies ever coming back to that fairy tale structure. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he said, well, that's what the gospel is. Do you know what the gospel is? And I said, no, like gospel music. And he said, no, gospel means good news. And this is the story of the Bible. Jesus is the knight in shining armor. We are the princess, the bride of Christ, who has been held captive by a serpent named Satan, put in a high tower away from our creator, put under a curse called sin, and that curse is what causes us to die and to go to hell. And it causes all the chaos and turmoil in the universe. But Jesus, our knight in shining armor, he lived the life that you and I could never live. The perfect life, sinless, blameless, righteous, slayed the dragon on the cross of Calvary when he died for your sin and my sin. 
cracked the grave three days later, rescues us from the power of sin by the power of his blood and the power of his Holy Spirit and allows us to live a life forever and ever, happily ever after with him in heaven because of what he did for us. I was like picking up pieces of my brain off the floor. My mind had been blown. And I was like, no one had ever explained to me what this meant, what this whole thing was about. And he concisely showed me that a relationship with God and reading, understanding the story of the Bible is not this religious rule book. Yeah, there's rule, there's laws in it, but it's so much more than that. It's this epic love story that's unfolded since the beginning of time, this book spanning the course of 1500 years over the years that it was written. And the theme is the same from literally book to book to book within the Bible, that God was on a rescue mission to rescue his bride from this dragon that kept us under the curse of sin. And when he shared that with me, everything changed. My interest in this thing changed. I was like, I need to know more about this. So he took me to church. I I was the only person dressed up fancy at church because I thought that's what you did. Everyone's wearing casual clothes. I'm looking like a nerd and I'm listening to the message and it's like, it's making sense. But I was really curious and I asked him, I said, why do all these people have their hands raised in worship? They look kind of weird doing that. And he said, those people are filled with the Holy Spirit. God literally lives inside of them and they are worshiping God that way because they're responding to him out of gratitude for what he's done for them. And I said, well, what's the difference between me and them? And he said, well, they've repented of their sin and they've confessed that Jesus is Lord and God has saved them and filled them with his spirit. And it's that simple. Confessing your sin, repenting, turning, putting your faith in Jesus and following him. That's it. And then he was like, do you want to do that right now? And I was like, heck no, but I'll let you know if I ever do. The very next day, I'm on my way to the gym. I'm in my car. I'm at a red light and the Holy Spirit just, just gets a hold of my heart. And he just says, give it up, man, give it up. And what he said to me was, you're, you've been the director of your, (laughs) and he said to me, there's only room on the set of your life for one director and you're not him. It's time for you to get out of the director's chair. And so I, I responded and I was like, God, I don't know who you are, but I got something to tell you. I just start confessing my sin. And I'm just bawling my eyes out. And I'm just like, God, forgive me. I don't even know. I don't even know who you are. I don't even know what I'm asking for forgiveness for, but I want to know you. I'm tired of living my life my own way. I want to serve you. And this went on for like minutes. I had to drive. I had to like go through the green light, get to the gym, park and go back into this confession. I'm bawling like a baby. And in the parking lot, if I went to the University of Miami right now and showed you, took you to the gym, I could show you the parking lot, the space where I got saved in. And it was in that moment where I said, God, I confess everything to you. I want, I want to serve you. I surrender my life to you. That everything shifted. I was born again. The backpack of shame and guilt and condemnation that I had felt my entire life, it fell off of me. And I felt peace for the first time. The peace that I was looking for in good works, the peace that I was looking for in drugs, the peace I was looking for in girls and drinking. All of it, it's an endless void. It's a bottomless pit. You'll never find it. And I found exactly what I was looking for in that moment when I gave my life to Jesus and the Prince of Peace met me in my car and I was wrecked. And he spoke to me in that moment and he said, Cap, I've been waiting for this day for a long time. I love you. I'm for you. You're not going to get it perfect, but let's just take progress together and let's make today day one. And ever since that day, like that was the day where literally it was like my, my BC to AD moment, like my human, my timeline of human history as a person split in that moment. And I was, I lived like a whole, that was the beginning of a completely new life. March 11th, 2013 in the parking lot at the gym at the university of Miami. And since then, I mean, God's done amazing things. I'll share this. Like, this is, it's kind of cool. It was a couple weeks later after that I had shared with my friend, God, dude, I gave my life to Jesus. I've, I'm born again. I'm saved. He was stoked, obviously. But it was two weeks after that I get a direct message on Facebook, a mess, Facebook message. And lo and behold, it's the lady from Mardi Gras. And she had taken my card that I'd given her and she looked up our website on, on the internet and she was like, hey, I just want to let you know I saw your website, love what you guys are doing, think, I think it's really cool. 
I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm really glad we met. And then I respond to her. I was like, it's just so crazy that your text, you just messaged me because I literally just gave my life to Jesus. And she was like, ah, like she was so over the top. She was like, I'm crying. My, I'm crying right now. I'm with my daughter. We've been praying for you ever since I met you. And I was like, dude, this thing is real. God is real. And since then, God has done amazing things in my life. He called me to Omaha, Nebraska, where I, uh, he spoke to me through a, a killer whale and a dream, actually. We'll save that for another episode. He called me to Omaha, Nebraska to be a part of a work here where I would use my filmmaking gifts and my content creation gifts to build his house here in Omaha, Nebraska. Met my wife here. We've had, we have three kids, started a, a kingdom first business. And God's been doing amazing things in my life since then. And it's been amazing. Been, it's been really amazing. And let me share this for just as we close. I just want to share that God wants to do the same thing in your life too. You can look completely different. You can come from a completely different background for me, but the stories, all of our stories are kind of the same in this regard. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. We are all deserving of the wrath of God for our sin, our rebellion against him. And uh, the wages of our sin is death. In this life, we'll die at some point in this life. 10 out of 10 people die. It's the great statistic. But then many people are going to go down this path of destruction. As my friend had said, many people are going to hell after they die, not because God doesn't love them, but because they didn't receive the forgiveness for their sin that was only possible through Jesus's sacrifice on the cross and the fulfillment of that sacrifice by the power of his resurrection. And it's a free gift. It's just a free gift. And if you want to receive that right now, here's the simple, here's what you got to do. You got to turn to God, kind of like I did in my car. And you got to say, God, I give it up. I turn from living my life my own way. I want to follow you. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you resurrected from the grave. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with your spirit and I will follow you. And I'm telling you, if it's genuine, if you're in a genuine place of turning, which is what repentance means, turning from living your own life, picking up your cross and saying, God, this life might not be easy following you. It's not easy, but where else will I go? You are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. That's what Jesus said in John 14, six, and I'm gonna follow you. And if that's you, or if you're at least curious about taking that next step, here's the call to action for you. In the description of this video slash episode, whether you're watching or listening, there's a link to my church's Facebook group. I'm an online pastor and I'd love to allow you to jump in and learn about the things of God, regardless of where you are in the faith spectrum, whether you've been walking with him for a while or you have no idea who God is, but you're curious, love for you to jump in and just learn how to practically follow this supernatural God of ours. And I would also like to encourage you again, if you like this video, please like, Please share, please comment, please subscribe. Please subscribe and share it with someone who might need this. If you're listening on a podcast platform, subscribe, please. But then also consider leaving a review, a five-star review, a good review. It's gonna help this message get out to more people. Finally, just wanna repeat this. You can support this work as I continue to create content for the kingdom. You can support it a couple of ways. Number one, the free way is to hop on the email list. Go to capchatfield.com, submit your email, stay in touch with what we're doing. It's gonna be the best way for me to stay in contact with you. But then the next way is to become a member, a member of what we're doing here. There's a lot of things I wanna do. I wanna create courses for, for people like you who are like, you know what, I wanna, I wanna share my story. I wanna be a kingdom content creator. I wanna use this device that literally lives in my hand in my pocket 24 seven. And I wanna use this for the glory of God. I want to train you and I'm giving, I'm creating a very simple membership. If you click the link, it'll give you access uh, to pay to become a monthly member, a supporter of this work. And you'll also get exclusive training um, that I'm not asking you to pay for the gospel. This training is specifically to help you become a kingdom content creator to steward your message, your media, and your marketing for the glory of God. So please do any of those things. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Directed Life. God bless you all. Take care. <laughs>